A warm welcome to the 2022 Winter Outlook webinar. My name is Anita and I'm your host. On our agenda today, we have a presentation and a panel discussion. I'm joined here by Stephen Davenport, our long range forecaster, who will present the outlook. This will be quickly followed by a panel discussion moderated by Brad Nelson and a panelist, Mary Fitazine and Troy Vincent. Before we start, I have a few housekeeping items to go over with you. Note, we are recording this session, so if you would like to listen to this again or share with your colleagues, we will be emailing you a link of this within a week. Post the event, we will also be sharing an Outlook report. Keep an eye on your inbox. Everyone is on mute. If you have any questions throughout the session, please use Q&A feature on the right side of your screen. And with that, I'm going to hand over the presentation to you, Stephen. Thank you, Anita. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. I'm Stephen Davenport, Weather Risk Communicator at DeepTN. Uh, firstly, uh, let's take a uh, look at what the, uh, we're going to take a look at what the uh, winter of 20. 122 gave us. We'll dive into uh, quickly into the forecast uh, techniques we use to give you your final forecast, including our uh, analogs and computer model projections. Then we'll get into the uh, seasonal outlook and uh, afterwards we'll have a panel discussion about uh, any industry impacts. So uh, we're going to look at uh, a review of the winter of 21, 22 in short, uh, milder less snowy winter than average. Uh, we were under the influence globally of a weak La Nina, a cool phase of the equatorial Pacific sea surface uh, temperatures. There was a strong jet stream typically through the winter further north than its average position, uh, exiting eastern Canada, crossing the Atlantic to the UK before driving southeast into eastern Europe. Uh, there were weaker winds to the south, especially across southwest Europe. Its position and strength of the jet stream uh, provided um, a barrier to cold polar outbreaks, uh, which was rather difficult to breach. No surprise then that the winter overall was warmer than average across most of Europe, uh, aside from Finland, northern parts of Scandinavia there. These are the temperature anomalies across Europe for the winter as a whole, parts of the Mediterranean uh, cooler than normal as well, but a lot of mild to warm weather last winter. Uh, dry as well in the southwest, and you can see where that uh, the storm track was uh, across northeastern Europe into eastern Europe. The UK, uh, zooming in there, had its uh, eighth mildest winter on record, dating back to the late 19th century. Low pressure systems tend to follow the jet stream, so it was a generally wet winter around the storm track. But in the UK, January became drier as uh, high pressure forced itself farther north across northwest Europe before a much wetter and windier February. Nevertheless, as far as precipitation went, uh, overall several regions ended up with uh, drier than average winter and uh, there were no real strong departures from average either way. Uh, for renewables, because of that uh, a uh, low pressure track, there were above average winds from Scotland, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland to Scandinavia and into Eastern Europe, low winds for France, Spain and Portugal. There were six powerful named windstorms through the winter season, the first of which in November 2021 prompted a rare, very rare red warning from the UK Met Office for Eastern Scotland and Northeast England. Then around the middle of February, February there were, uh, that was uh, Storm Harwin, by the way. Around the middle of February, there were three strong storms in pretty quick succession. Uh, Dudley, Eunice and Franklin went with uh, further two red warnings issued. Uh, Eunice produced wind gusts over 81 miles per hour even inland and uh, Needles in the Isle of Wight saw a gust of 122 miles per hour, a new record for England. Solar radiation, as you'd expect from this sort of pattern, um, with the High pressure across southern Europe um, gave us above average solar, especially for Spain and Italy. Um, in Spain, that's rather tempered by relatively poor winds throughout the winter. 
Given the above average temperatures, below normal precipitation for some areas, there was less snow than an average year. Western and northwestern Europe were short of snow compared with average, but the Alps were near normal except for the Italian Alps. Well, so much for uh, last winter. What about this uh, coming winter? Will it be colder, snowier? Well, we start start with is a rather low confidence forecast. So you might say that's always the case with a seasonal forecast, but the fact that the models differ somewhat and uh, somewhat different to the uh, analogs makes it especially so at the moment for the coming winter. Nevertheless, fair to say it's unlikely to be as consistently and wildly, widely mild as last winter. And we have risks of colder than normal conditions developing for Western Europe in early winter, maybe starting in late November. Northern Europe, mainly Scandinavia, any anomalous colds more likely to be focused in January and uh, February. Meanwhile, we're expecting an active storm track across Eastern Europe, above average precipitation here, but much of Europe should be uh, drier than normal. One thing we're less likely to see compared with last winter is that strong jet so far north all the time. More likely it'll dip southwards at times, especially during December, which helps out these expected colder risks. So firstly, what are the main influences we're considering when uh, making projections for this winter season? Well, there's the uh, state of the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO, which plays a large role globally, 40% or more, if it, even more if it's uh, strong. Um, as we've seen in the highlights, a negative ENSO should continue into the winter, in other words, a La Nina state. And this will be the third winter in a row with La Nina in place. And that doesn't happen too often, so analogs a few on the ground for that particular circumstance. But on the whole, ENSO has a pretty good predictability skill. Added to that, there are polar vortex and uh, subseasonal, subseasonal influences, such as the Madden Julian oscillation, that's the convection and strong thunderstorms in tropical regions that can change the pattern in a shorter range. And then there's persistent, what's been happening recently, and we can figure that out easily from observations of the recent past through the last 10 years. And finally, we look at uh, recent, recent trends, which uh, obviously have pretty uh, good skill. Uh, La Nina, as I said, is in its third year. It's uncommon, so that it immediately presents challenges to the forecast, but we can deal with it as another La Nina winter for our analog purposes. And for a third year event, it's uh, rather a strong uh, La Nina. It's forecast to persist into the winter and remain a significant driver of global weather patterns. But its strength uh, looks to have plateaued or beginning to plateau, and, it's, and uh, we're expecting it to slowly weaken. Um, other oceanic Drivers, um, we, know we have a lot of uh, excess warmth in the North Pacific with a narrow horseshoe of cooler water towards the coasts of Western Canada and the Northwest USA. This is the negative uh, cold state of the PDO, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Rather a strong negative state at that. The Atlantic's been much warmer than normal and sea surface temperatures will likely stay above average into the winter. And this is a positive or warm phase of the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation or AMO. Now, these are slow changing temperature patterns, so they're pretty solid clues for long range and seasonal weather. So looking back into past instances uh, that are similar can give us clues to the future. Uh, if we can match up some analog years for these particular oceanic conditions. And the polar vortex state can dictate whether any uh, lasting outbreaks southwards of Arctic air might occur. At the moment, any significant cold outbreaks uh, like that are more likely for North America and Central and East Asia. Let's take a look at uh, the ENSO to start with. Uh, here are the model predictions through winter and beyond uh, to the middle of next year from modeling centers around the world. Uh, there are some differences and therefore uncertainties, uh, but what you can see is they mostly show uh, an overall trend for La Nina to weaken as the equatorial uh, Pacific warms. Uh, red line uh, is the average of these models, and that gets up into neutral territory by next spring, a neutral uh, ENSO state. And then who knows beyond that, perhaps a developing El Nino later in 2023, as a couple of models are showing here, but that's um, that's really another story for another time. Our analogs uh, tell a similar tale. These are years with similar ocean temperatures to those we're expecting into the winter this year. Um, you can see the analog years in question on the right here in order of how close we think they fit. 
Uh, although there's quite a spread here as well, the average, um, albeit starting less negative than we're currently observing, is for a similar steadying than upward trend. <clears throat> and that fits into the model guidance uh, pretty well. Uh, the oceans, of course, are a major driver of the climate. Here are the sea surface temperature anomaly analogs for those same years. Um, and our analogs are showing a pretty good fit to the, what we're seeing at the moment and what we're expecting uh, through the winter. Cool waters of the equatorial Pacific, that's our La Nina state, the warmth of the North Pacific, uh, and that cooler water near the coasts of Canada and the US, and the warmer than normal pool in the Atlantic, especially off the Canadian Maritimes where we're seeing the strongest uh, uh, heat at the minute. So our analogs cover what we're seeing uh, pretty well. Um, of course, the oceans have been warming over the past decades, so there'll be a, a bit of difference, but the overall pattern uh, is there. So how do we arrive at the final forecast? Um, past years with similar oceanic sea surface temperature patterns have produced colder than average conditions across Northern and Western Europe, although mostly moderate cold and not sustained deep freezes. However, we have to bear in mind, especially in our changing climate, uh, we've got to take in the, those trends and of course, guidance from the seasonal output of the global models. So in the simplified chart, we're illustrating how the climate trend and model input makes the forecast warmer than using analogs alone, but also illustrates the challenges faced with this forecast and it's rather low confidence given disparity between analogs and models, especially the CFS V2 model, which is pretty mild all winter. So we weight all these inputs um, and simply uh, to put it simply, uh, blend them together to come to the final forecast for each month and for the season as a whole. There are several sources of interest seasonal variability, just to muddy the waters a bit, not least the state of the polar vortex, as we've touched on. As, now, this is the, the pool of cold air around the polar regions, ordinarily bounded in winter by strong stratospheric winds and the jet stream holding in frigid Arctic air. We've seen in years past, though, that the polar vortex, vortex can weaken, split, displace, um, like the winters of 2009-10 and 2010-11 in Europe that brought some very cold outbreaks. So uh, the strong cold polar vortex keeps the Arctic cold bottled up uh, in the polar regions, uh, allows milder flows at mid latitudes, uh, aside from localised blocking events such as we might see in December. Weaker polar vortex can be displaced, disturbed, split, leading to block weather patterns as the, as the jet waves around and extends farther north and south, which allows warm air to move anomalously far north in some places and cold air to drop southwards in others. And you can see lobes or pockets of the polar vortex dropping south, bringing very cold air with them. Although we sometimes can have an idea on whether any winter might be more susceptible to such a weakening, there aren't ever any guarantees. Um, an accurate prediction is only possible over shorter lead times, uh, typically a couple of weeks or so, especially when gauging uh, which part of the northern hemisphere is most likely uh, to be affected. Uh, oftentimes, this is eastern parts of North America and uh, into Central Eastern Asia, which is the kind of thing we're expecting this year. Uh, but Europe can occasionally be uh, affected similarly. A uh, full breakdown of the polar vortex looks less likely this winter because of other factors. Um, that includes a positive or westerly phase of the quasi-biennial oscillation. Uh, last winter, there was actually a greater risk of a weaker polar vortex, but uh, we actually ended up with the strongest polar vortex on record. Um, our analogues indicate uh, this potential for uh, December weakening and displacement, maybe leading to a more blocked pattern with anomalous high pressure over Greenland. Uh, maybe a little hard to make out Europe there, but it's uh, spun around to the right here and those greens or orange colors showing the build in pressure over Greenland. Uh, this would be a negative state of the North Atlantic Oscillation or NAO, and that uh, induces colder flows across parts of Europe. So that's the colder risk to our early winter forecast. By January and February, that block has declined. So we consider any cold risks in Europe to be driven more by this blocking near Greenland rather than the, any kind of polar vortex breakdown and, uh, and any risk of much colder air, uh, Arctic air masses from, say, Russia. I thought this was interesting, though. Um, there's a little bit of a wrinkle. You may remember the eruption of the Hunga Tonga Hunga Haiapai volcano way back in uh, January. 
Um, that ejected a huge amount of water vapor high into the atmosphere and cooled the stratosphere in the southern hemisphere considerably, which you can see from that broad blue band there on the left from Australia to South America. Now that moisture has been slowly working its way northwards towards the mid latitudes of the northern hemisphere. If you take a look at the uh, water content on the right there over the past decade and a half, you can see the change this year, bottom right, uh, dark smear of green south of the equator, recently, recently pushing northwards. Now, if that moisture were to cool the stratosphere in the northern hemisphere, then it could strengthen the polar vortex, make any cold belt breaks less likely. Should stress, though, that this is an unprecedented eruption. We've never before recorded so much for vapor expelled into the stratosphere from a volcano. So it's kind of an unknown quantity, but it's an interesting consideration at least. On to the model guidance now though, and the uh, main models we use are the CFS V2 and the ECMWF seasonal global models. Uh, firstly, here's the CFS V2, and even just at a glance, you can see lots of orange and red indicating uh, above average temperatures widely from November to uh, January. Uh, bearing in mind our analogues, it's looking too warm. Uh, and if you look at the precipitation projection, the areas are drier than normal, a little more suggestive maybe of a block pattern than a mild and wet one. One notable aspect of the precipitation outlook here is dry conditions each month across Southeast Europe. And it's not only December through to January that looks mild, even warm. This continues on through February and March, according to the CFS uh, V2 model anyway. Uh, north and northwest Europe are wetter than normal in February, which at least coincides with uh, expectations of a milder westerly regime as we get to that part of the winter, a positive state, a flip to the positive state of the NAO with any high pressure blocking over Greenland less likely. ECMWF guidance uh, is a little different, especially early to midwinter. Uh, November kicks off almost universally warmer than normal, but there are hints of cooling in Western Europe in December, but more especially and more widely in, in January here. Uh, this is a result of it introducing high pressure to the north, so that would have been drier than normal for northern areas as well, with low pressure systems sliding into the Mediterranean. Note the wet signal there, especially for Italy, the Western Mediterranean, Greece and parts of the Balkans. For February and March, though, a reversal of the pattern. Unlike the CFS V2 and our analogues, a positive NAO regime with broadly westerly type flows delivering above normal temperatures for the late winter and into early spring. And a switch in the regions of highest pre precipitation. So ECMWF is suggesting a pickup in precipitation and higher, higher winds across northern Europe to end the winter and maybe to start the spring while the reverse will be true for Southern Europe. With all this in mind, the analogues, the intraseasonal risks and the models, let's dig into the details of our final forecast. So here's the DTN view of temperatures uh, month by month through the winter, the overall winter average from December to February, a mild November for most of Europe. And as it's relatively short range, uh, this leans towards the, the model output. We can be a little more confident in, in the models for this period. Uh, but note that we are seeing some signs later in November of cooling to seasonal or even slightly below normal temperatures for Western Europe. But then we come to the period of highest risk for some colder weather in December, at least for Central and Western Europe, near normal or below average temperatures driven in large part by the analogues and to a degree the ECMWF model. Uh, if we get this overall cold, there would still likely be milder interludes low. Uh, any air flowing from the Atlantic in between times would be warmer than otherwise, given the warmth of the Atlantic at the minute and the continued warmth we're expecting into the winter. So expect some notable variability week to week. Meanwhile, eastern, southeastern and south central Europe, uh, south -central Europe uh, are going to remain uh, above average. Hand in hand with this, Northern Europe is more likely to be drier and calmer than normal with wetter and windier conditions for uh, Southern Europe. Some of that colder air possibly hangs on into January, but by February, most areas see in temperatures rise again. Uh, the exception though is Northern Europe, especially Norway and much of Sweden, where we're expecting more troughing to set up with consequent colder outbreaks leading to near or below average temperatures for those two months and for the winter overall. 
Uh, as I noted earlier, confidence is rather low. Um, here's our current forecast flanked by the risks, which are tied chiefly to weakening of La Nina and on the behavior of the polar vortex. Any deeper cold Arctic intraseasonal outbreaks and stronger northern blocking would rather heavily skew the winter temperature downwards uh, with that risk chiefly at the start of the season, as uh, some of our analogues are showing. However, initial conditions, indications are for um, increased cold risks to be across North America and Central and Eastern Asia. Now, if none of that December cold emerges in Europe, then that would tip the forecast towards the warmer smart scenario, more like the CFS V2 model. Uh, trends over the past decade show us how difficult it really is to reach significant early winter cold. It just hasn't been happening in the way we've seen in uh, previous years and decades and before the last 10. Um, there's also a risk of a polar vortex breakdown later winter. And if, if this early winter cold doesn't develop at all, then this uh, risk increases a little around February and March. So that would also skew the forecast towards the colder side for the winter as a whole. Something else worth noting, the unusual warmth of the Atlantic. Actually, I've already touched on that. If we get the blocked pattern early in winter, that won't really be in play because wind flows will be more from the easterly quarter across uh, Western Europe. But any flows through the Atlantic would be warmer uh, than we would expect otherwise, given those high sea surface temperatures. Now, looking at what the weather's doing at the moment, you might ask what's going to change this year, current mild, even warm pattern across the Europe to bring us these colder risks by December. Uh, something needs to kickstart a change. Uh, one culprit could be the Madden Julian oscillation or MJO. It's uh, an oscillating pattern of enhanced and suppressed convection that propagates eastwards across the tropics. Uh, for a 30 to 60 day time period. Um, it manifests mostly over the Pacific Indian Oceans um, and has impacts in the mid latitudes. Uh, by mid to late December, the forecast is for strong convection to develop around Southeast Asia and what we call the maritime continent around uh, Indonesia. Uh, you can see that in the uh, charts from 9th to 15th, 16th to 22nd of November, that uh, area of, um, of green. Uh, building up there. Um, and uh, that could um, ultimately shift uh, high pressure northwards and instigate the, the sort of blocking at high latitudes in the northern hemisphere we're looking for to bring these colder chances in December. Uh, one other thing we need to watch is the North Pacific. Um, there are indications of typhoon development there. Uh, and if a strong cyclone were to develop recurve northeast, it would cause a sharpening downstream of the ridge and trough pattern across North America, and then ultimately across the Atlantic as well. So that could also conceivably uh, assist in northern blocking development, but that's a little bit of a wild card in the shorter range. Back to the forecast, uh, looking at the precipitation, by the time we get to December through to January, we've got a signature of high pressure to the north low to the south, hence less precipitation for Northern Europe, especially from the Northern UK to Scandinavia, except for Southern Sweden, uh, and above normal precipitation for much of Central, Eastern, Southern Europe, especially the Med, as low pressure systems slide south of the high pressure block. We see that well in the December to February charts. Uh, we are looking at the forecast anomalies on the left, probabilities of above and below average precipitation on the right. As far as renewables are concerned, with that southerly low pressure track at times through the winter, we're expecting above normal wind production around the Med for Spain, Italy, Balkans, Romania, Southeast Europe in general. Uh, that comes at the expense of the more northern regions, so the UK, the Netherlands, Scandinavia, northern Germany, those kinds of areas uh, probably are going to see below normal production. Around February, though, as long as the pattern flips as expected, we, we should see an uptick in winds overall for those northern regions as low pressure systems uh, move through. Solar production is looking relatively poor, with southern Europe likely to be cloudier than normal, which is hardly a surprise given the moisture laden systems we're expecting to see pass through there. Some improvements to southern Europe look possible later in the winter as the pattern flips across, especially around February. Uh, to put all this in uh, global context, uh, temperature and precipitation forecasts 
uh, look like this. A lot of anomalous warmth, but standouts are cold across much of Canada, and the east central USA, and from eastern Russia into northeast China, so East Asia in general. Uh, rather a dry look in the southern US and around the coasts, and wet signals in northern South America and the subtropical regions of Australia, and some hints as well for eastern parts of uh, Victoria and New South Wales down in Australia there. Finally, putting all that together is our summary for Europe. Cold risks early in the winter for Western and Northwestern Europe, then becoming milder and turning wetter and windier across Northern Europe uh, later in the winter. Overall drier and calmer than normal for Northern Europe though, while Southern Europe is wetter and windier than normal as well as milder. Southern Europe becomes drier later in the winter um, for Eastern Europe, most likely an occasional active storm track delivering above normal precipitation and wind, especially for the southern half of Eastern Europe, along with above normal temperatures, not necessarily mild and snow free because you know, the baseline is is cold. So um, a fair amount of snow is possible there, especially at the higher elevations for Scandinavia and Finland, a broadly colder and drier winter than normal with less wind. Uh, coldest risks, unlike Western Europe, look like being later in the winter chiefly January and February. And that's our forecast. I'll now pass back to our host and our moderator. Perfect. Thank you so much, Stephen. Now I would like to invite Brad Nelson, a weather risk communicator. He will be a moderator for the panel. And joining Brad, we have Willie Vitefstein, a senior solutions engineer for utilities, and Troy Vincent, a senior market analyst for energy commodities. Excellent. Thank you, Anitha. Uh, hi, Welcome, everyone. Brad. Yeah. It's uh, great to be here. Um, we have a terrific group here of weather risk industry experts on the panel today to discuss the DTN winter outlook. Really want to focus on the impacts of the expected long range forecast on several industries, uh, primarily focusing more on our, our expertise in the utilities and the energy uh, industries with today's panel. So um, it's obviously important for businesses, consumers, companies to understand the current state of the world, um, some of the turmoil and disruptions that may be occurring, um, and really how the expected forecast conditions that Stephen mentioned with the outlook is gonna impact energy demand and shortages oil and natural gas prices, budgets, um, impacts on supply chain and business disruption. So this panel is going to address some of those key questions and important points about the winter season. Um, so that with that, let's get going on the first topic. So as Stephen mentioned, the DTN winter outlook currently calls for overall near to above normal temperatures for the bulk of Europe uh, with some early season cold risks. So my question is, Really, how does this impact utilities across the region in regards to preparedness? Like, how do why how and why do utilities prepare and attempt to mitigate uh, cold season risks on their operations and supply and demand? And with particular focus on, you know, how do how do they prepare more for early season risks compared to late season risks, and just overall that potential for the polar vortex to break down and bring uh, those um, kind of unrealized cold risks uh, into the forecast. So I, I want to start with Willie on that side and then um, really uh, would like to go over to Troy to talk more about the kind of the supply and demand side. Yeah, typically uh, utilities, they, uh, they perform, as they call it, stress test. And basically they want to see whether they are, uh, whether it's possible to uh, um, uh, balance the gas and power demand and supply. And with the cu current possible shortage of, of gas that has been identified, uh, uh, a longer cold, out cold outbreak, uh, it might be very difficult to, uh, to have a balance in demand and supply. And that's what they have identified. That's, um, and in order to control that, normally you would uh, increase the supply, but with a possible shortage of gas, that could be difficult. And therefore they have identified that it might be necessary to do a curtailment of the, of the demand. 
which is exceptional. And that leads to a higher interest for the long-term forecast, because if you want to curtail demand, it needs preparation. Preparation takes time. And so that, that's basically the situation that is uh, currently, uh, yeah, a topic in the stress test. I think you're on mute, Brett. Sorry. Yeah. Bad. Uh, so, yeah, that's interesting about the stress tests and how they will uh, perform those uh, based on, you know, the outlook and in particular to a potential shortage of gas supply. So, um, Droid, do you mind uh, speaking on the overall supply and demand and what you're seeing uh, sure. in Europe? Yeah, of course. I mean, to Willie's point, you know, there's there's always like seasonal preparedness going on, right? As we're as we're working into winter, and of course that that starts well before winter, you know, many months before winter. Um, whether that's hedging gas uh, prices and you know uh, the, from from the utility generation level, or as he said, stress testing and trying to model out you know potentials. But uh, as he as he mentioned, of course, this year you know it's I think everyone is well aware, right? It's it's more dire than ever the situation to to get these uh, kind of stress tests and calculations and 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 modeled outlooks correct. And, uh, you know, that ultimately has to do with European natural gas imports being down about 25% from their seasonal norm. And that's even including, you know, rep, more or less record LNG volumes for the seasonal period as well. So you clearly have a, a, you have a, a very sustained period looking forward where natural gas imports are going to be constrained. And because natural gas imports are going to be constrained, largely because of lack of natural gas or LNG import and regasification capacity, that then trickles into the broader market, of course, and what we've seen here in the very near term is as a kind of a, an odd phenomenon because we had prices, of course, ramp up to record highs this summer as this uh, gas supply crunch really took hold. But as we've moved through the winter and we've had uh, temperatures kind of in Northwest Europe about 6% above the 30 year norm um, here recently, as you've had these unseasonably warm temperatures uh, across Europe broadly. And as you've had this, um, you know, this continued strength and pace of LNG arrivals and the, the constraints of off, uh, export and import, I'm sorry, import offtake capacity there, it really has set up the scenario where you've seen prices collapse over the past couple of weeks because the, the natural gas market is one that is very physical. It has to be cleared in the physical, you know, in, in the physical realm, it's not just a financial tool. And that essentially means they have to find buyers and the spot market in the very near term, actually, you might have seen in headlines uh, just in recent days in the hour ahead market has actually went negative. Uh, so we've, we've really been in this crazy volatile market for many months now. But what we're seeing, um, you know, in the very near term, as I said, is, is, is a reflection of this demand curtailment that we've seen in addition to this. Um, the, the strength in LNG imports, which have allowed EU natural gas storage to be currently at about 94% full, which is well ahead of the seasonal norm and, you know, uh, kind of at the top of the most optimistic end of expectations heading into winter. Yeah, and that, uh, that short term decrease in price led to a yeah, assumption by the users that they could continue to use gas as normal. <laughs> like in previous years, whereas when there would be a cold spell coming, it still would be very difficult to have enough supply. So that's independent of the pricing mechanism that works now short term with looking at the warmer weather. But when there would be a cold spell, there is just a physical fact that there might be a shortage of gas supply. And, and, and that is where the utilities are preparing for. So do you think there would be do you think it would be better off right now, even with a surplus to have higher prices that would trickle down to cust the customers to drive behavioral changes uh, ahead of time leading into the winter season? Yeah, it would be a more consistent story towards the end user that doesn't know how the whole energy market system works. You know? And what you have seen is when the prices of the gas increased, then people started to use less. They just dropped down heating um, and they also were looking for alternatives, like they switched to electrical heating. 
And so that, that's how the pricing mechanism in the market works. Um, if you don't get that signal anymore, you might think, okay, it's okay to continue to use the gas as normal. Yeah. Whereas from a, a physical perspective, like a balancing perspective, we might still get into a situation when there is a longer cold spell that we will have a shortage of supply. So. Yeah, I mean, to your point, just here in very recent days, you've already seen European fertilizer, uh, like ammonia producers restarting as gas prices have collapsed. Now, I, I do think, you know, it's also just this very um, odd kind of predicament that, that Europe is, find it, uh, or is finding itself in at the moment because it needs these spot LNG cargos. It needs that constant flow of these arrivals uh, of, of LNG. But at the same time, there's a timing issue that largely, once again, depends on weather, as I said, right? If, you, if you're planning on a normal temperature scheme and temperatures are above normal and you are booking LNG cargos to arrive, assuming that there's gonna be this kind of seasonally normal demand, and then that demand does not uh, appear because you have normal or uh, above normal temperatures, what happens is that LNG cargo is just stranded offshore waiting to waiting for onshore storage space. And as a result, it causes this steep discounting in the very near term kind of hour ahead, day ahead uh, pricing uh, to, to try to ultimately clear the onshore storage so that that volume offshore can can come off the off the ship. Got it. And I, I was going to ask too about, um, you know, we mentioned, you kind of mentioned, well, what if there's some, you know, surprises? Like you have a long, you have a long duration warm spell, and then all of a sudden a significant cold risk, uh, polar vortex breaks down. You have seven to, seven to 10 days of extreme cold um, that wasn't well forecast uh, after like a month or two of above normal temperatures. So, how does the the general like the real quick hitting cold snaps actually impact the market um, and pricing and utilities uh, compared to the longer duration cold spells that aren't as significant? Maybe we can start with you, Willie. If you got any thoughts on that, or well, I, I think. Uh, what is important to realize is that utilities, they have multiple ways of, of balancing supply and demand. So, and, and some of it means that they um, now decided with the possible shortage of gas that they want to keep um, production units that they wanted to shut down, wanted to keep them up and running, like nuclear plants, like reserve capacity, like coal fire plants even in order to be always able to fulfill the demand. And that's something atypical, and that's something that takes time. It's not like a short-term decision. You can fire up gas-fired plants very fast, but when you talk about nuclear plants, it takes planning, it takes time, and they had to make decisions now in order to, to be prepared for any cold spell, cold spell that comes in. And that's where you see the basically the market reacts very fast. Prices are dropping because it's warm currently. <laughs> but if mm -hmm. you want to be able to react on a cold spell in the longer term, you need to take your actions and plan those actions. And I just mentioned like keeping up the supply. Um, there's also when you want to control the demand, which is a anticipated mechanism that could kick in possibly, um, then also takes planning yeah, you need to prepare for it so if you want to shut down major using industries that needs planning you cannot just shut them down or uh, ask them to use less that takes planning and that's what the utilities have been doing they already went into those actions like months ago in order to be prepared to cope with a cold spell longer cold spell yeah, and, and to your point, Brad, right, there, there, is, there is risk that you have something like an, on average, warmer than normal winter, but you have a deep polar vortex, um, for example, that drives a, a short period of time, but very extremely cold temperatures that can rapidly eat away at gas inventories. And, mm -hmm. and that is, you know, that is, of course, I think, based on the current weather outlook, the, the biggest risk that I see uh, for this winter 
uh, when it comes to European prices is that you, you know, on, on average, you get a warmer temp, but maybe you get a few of these very deep cold spells that wind up, uh, you know, eroding natural gas inventories very quickly, because as I said, the, the flow of, uh, of supply into Europe is still 20, down 25% um, from normal levels. And there's really no way to recover that this winter. So that, that implies that demand is, is the key here. Demand is, is the piece that has to balance the market because there's the incremental ability to import more supply. It just, just isn't there because of the LNG import capacity constraints. Yeah, and then on top of it, the change in behavior might cause extra problems. Like when people switch to electrical heating, the grid is not prepared to supply the amount of power that will be requested at that time. So it, it, it will be kind of overloaded. There's extra transport capacity needed, especially when you look at a country like Germany, where the production is in the north, the demand is in the south. That's where you need transport capacity. And if the uh, demand for power increases as steeply as anticipated, they will simply have like a difficulty in, uh, in arranging that transport from north to south. Yeah, that's a good point that, you you know, electrical power or heating for heating, especially is really disruptive, can have its own disruptions um, and problems as well. So let's to, to, guess. to Willie's point, I'm just going to say, you know, to Willie's point, you've seen a number of steps that just a year ago, many thought were politi politically unfeasible. You know, you've mm -hmm. seen Germany announce that they're going to keep their nuclear generation running through the end of the year that uh, they've actually they're now planning to add about seven uh, gigawatts of of coal capacity that will be potentially online for another two years. So yeah, they're, you know, they're gearing up for rising electricity demand in any way that they can. Well, that's good, right? I mean, the more you plan, the better. And it seems like there's a higher focus on weather in general and longer, the longer term forecast specifically, um, you know, in kind of this, this day and age uh, than what was previously done. Um, one thing I wanted to ask uh, Stephen, uh, can you can you kind of mention again when are the main risk periods for kind of that extreme cold again or prolonged cold uh, for certain certain areas of Europe? Um, just so we can get a, a reminder of what you had mentioned in the outlook. You're on mute, Stephen. Thank you, foolish of me. Yeah, we're looking at um, for Western and Northwestern Europe, uh, early winter as we move into December, even the, the end of November, starting to look at maybe some anomalous cold uh, creeping in. We're not necessarily looking at the kind of uh, outbreak of uh, deep sustained cold that you'd get with a, a breakup of the polar vortex. It's more to do with blocking over Greenland, just driving in uh, cooler air flows. So not necessarily a deep uh, cold in the uh, in that part of winter and also we're you know, expecting it to be somewhat variable as well there'll be times when the flu switches to come off that very warm atlantic so um december could be you know, typified by quite uh, large switches in temperature but overall uh, for western northwestern europe uh, near normal or, or slightly colder now, there's also a risk uh, later in the winter and if there should be a break up in the polar vortex then uh, February and into March uh, could be uh, another issue, I think, especially if we don't get this cold developing in December and it's a fairly low confidence forecast. And it does actually increase the chances of that occurrence uh, later in the winter. So that would be another period to look out for, for perhaps stronger cold. We're not uh, forecasting that at the moment, but uh, as we go you know, through later February and begin the spring as we go into March, uh, there is a risk there of colder outbreaks occurring or anywhere in Europe. Thanks, Stephen. The um, I kind of wanted to shift gears a little bit, unless um, you know Willie or Troy, you have any other thoughts on utility industry uh, and the winter outlook. I was going to shift over to more of the business and consumer side, if you don't mind. Um, so, as some example markets, uh, you, uh, UK, France, Denmark. Um, Let's talk about like think about major disruptions to the supply chain around the holidays um, to due to winter storms. You know, how does that when we get big storms around the holidays and particularly, you know, late December, early January, you know, what impacts does that have around supply chain uh, overall? 
and the disruptions. Uh, wanted to kind of get your thoughts on on that. And does this impact actually the energy markets as well and utilities when you have major winter storms uh, across you know northern Europe? You can start with that. Go ahead, Troy. I can, yeah, I can, I can start <laughs> on that one. I mean, look, um, in in my view, really, and I think I think we're now seeing this uh, trickle through in, into just broader macroeconomic indications. Uh, whether you you know you're looking at kind of foreign exchange markets and currencies, or or many many parts of the macroeconomic picture, it, it's quite clear, right? Uh, no matter where you're looking globally at the moment, that the energy prices are trickling into every part of the global economy. And, um, you know, at, at the moment in a, in a very detrimental way. So, I, I think that, you know, when you think about winter risk, uh, once again, it's, it's any, any reprieve that weather can give uh, the demand side is going to be welcome to every part of the supply chain, welcome to every part of the, the, the consuming, uh, you know, public as well. Because this is already the point now, now we've been about a year into this uh, extremely high um, energy prices across Europe. You know, this has been very detrimental to the uh, to the refining sector, uh, you know, oil and gas refining. It's been very detrimental to the industrial sector, manufacturing. Um, this is where you've seen the vast majority of demand destruction actually take place. Uh, in the first eight months of this year, demand is down about 15 percent in the industrial sector in Europe. And so it, you can clear, clearly see, you know, the, the, the costs of high um, electricity and gas prices and just kind of energy commodity prices more broadly. Uh, hitting every piece of the global economy, but in you know in particular the European economy, where the where the most of this is being felt directly. And as far as far as risks go, you know, like I said a moment ago, with this with the uh, d decline in price, we've already seen some fertilizer and ammonia uh, companies saying that they're going to restart uh, with with prices down. But you know how long that can last is is. In my estimation, probably not much more than a month, month and a half before they start to see, you know, prices start to rise once again. As as Willie said a moment ago, or, or alluded to, you know, prices in the the spot market, these kind of day ahead, uh, hour ahead markets are extremely low at the moment. But if you just look into the futures market on, say, TTF natural gas, you can see that, uh, you know, the the, the supply demand imbalance is still well priced in as we look through the remainder of the winter. Um, far, you know, they're, they're still in far excess of, of what would have been seen, you know, just just kind of pre COVID norms, uh, should I say. So we're, you know, we're still multiples uh, as far as price goes ahead of, of what we would have, you know, ever seen in the economy just is, is really, you know, suffering, like I said, from the from the consume the consumption end uh, at, at the retail level, all the way up to the production end, uh, the industrial production of, of metals or the heavy manufacturing industries. It's really interesting, just the overall impact and what's going on. Um, I, I think, you know, what's, I guess we really need to hope for a near to above normal winter and, and uh, not as many, you know, large winter storm events, because uh, that will basically help everyone. Yes. So, uh, Steve and Willie, any thoughts there? Um, otherwise, we can move on to the next topic, but I think that was well said. Yeah, just thinking of the timing of any stormier periods um, that would mm -hmm. come as we flip back to a, a more uh, westerly pattern, the latter part of winter. So it could be chances as we head towards February of, uh, of you know, wind storms taking over the main risk uh, you know, from, from the cold risks until we get maybe to late February and, and into March, as I mentioned. Yeah, that could probably be expected with that warmer, you know, warmer <laughs> period. Uh, you have an actual, um, you know, more active storm track. Compared to the colder, drier, um, early yeah. early winter periods. So, yeah, and on the supply side, stronger winds are okay. If not that strong, but if it will be a yeah. windy season, that will be okay. Uh, also, from the transportation side of power, that will be okay because you can apply a service like dynamic line rating, where the cooling of the power lines will accommodate a, a larger transport. And that's also typical for winter time. So that that's a good combination, you could say. Whereas when it's really getting to a level where it's disruptive for the operations of a grid, <laughs> that's where it's getting problematic. But I would say that's not depending on long-term forecast or uh, really influencing the demand supply situation. 
Mm -hmm. Those are more shorter term uh, interruptions of the grid that need to be solved as soon as possible. And one oh. of the risks, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, Stephen. Uh, one of the risks in the kind of pattern we're looking at with the blocking to the north and uh, low pressure systems to the south, there's more of a threat in Western Europe, Northwestern Europe in particular, Northern Europe in general, of uh, this milder air from the south. Precipitation there from meeting that colder air and bringing enhanced risks for uh, um, difficult phenomena like wet snow, you know, accreting, uh, even for uh, freezing rain events. So that may be something to, to bear in mind, especially during the transition period. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, the, those freezing rain events can cause absolute havoc, major disruptions, um, you know, across all ways of life, all industries, um, you know, across the region. So if you have a higher risk of that, it's great for our DTN risk communicators to convey that you know, for our partners to know the, the potential of that as soon as possible, um, especially if it looks like an elevated risk in a certain area. Um, you know, if you're at certain part at a certain time in winter too, so. Um, the last, kind of the last topic I wanted to focus on was tra uh, road maintenance, uh, the transport industry. You know, what, how do, how do they prepare for forecast active winter season Compared to an exp expected quieter season, Stephen, you might be able to, you know, speak on this with your experience a little more about, well, how do they, you know, are they making preparations in certain areas that are expected to be colder and more active for uh, larger supply of salt and grit, um, and what other kind of hazard mitigation activities might road maintenance um, industry? Uh, take leading up to the winter season. Yeah, um, well, the main thing is is resources, uh, human resources, as well as um, um, material resources like salt. Um, as I understand it, budgets are set uh, pretty early, uh, fairly um, <clears throat> generic based on uh, you know average conditions uh, through a winter. So it's really dependent on which which area you're, you're going to be treating. Um, but it, I think it is useful for authorities to know where the pinch points might be in in the coming winter. Um, if there's a cold, deep cold expected uh, in a forecast in late winter, then they can uh, maybe uh, conserve some sorting resources uh, for later winter. Now, as it happens, um, forecasts such as this winter, there may be more of a demand um, early winter, which uh, it maybe will impact later resources. Um, we hope that it won't be you know, too impactful, not too cold early winter, um, but you know, could make it harder to stockpile for any <clears throat> um, late, uh, later and, and worse outbreaks um, of cold later in the winter. Um, one thing to say, I guess, about December is um, and late November as well. There's still a lot of residual subsurface warmth in the roads uh, that won't be there later on. So any cold spells may not be you know, too impactful early in the winter, just depending how cold it gets. But if we do get these cold spells in December, you can very quickly scavenge that uh, subsurface warmth. So further we get into December, uh, the more likely it is, as long as you get this expected uh, cold spell, that uh, there'll be more and more demand on, uh, on resources uh, and materials. Um, Snow, of course, is another issue. We were looking at uh, drier than normal conditions through the early winter, you know, despite the cold risks. But yeah, ha having said that, it only takes uh, you know one you know, weather system to come through to dump a bunch of snow. Maybe a, a you know, low just drifting up from the north, as uh, already mentioned, just uh, you know, bringing some snow northwards across northern parts of Europe, uh, just as just to skew it. And that kind of thing is just um, you know impossible to predict anything. You know, rather than uh, any any time frame longer than you know, a week or so, week to ten days. I was um, looking at some of the uh, the treatment for um, some of the sites just in in the UK. Um, um, it's quite um, uh, quite a contrast in the winters of 2021, which is a bit cooler than the very mild winter they had uh, last year. This was in the southern UK. There were about half as many you know, critical you know, action worthy nights um, mm. um, last winter compared to, to the winter before. So it's um, 
And um, when I talk about critical nights, that's so temperatures of three Celsius or lower, when there was a risk of, uh, of frosts uh, forming. So um, it can be quite uh, uh, you know, a large spread in actionable nights, yes, really depending on the nature of the, of the winter. And maybe even bring a, a false sense of uh, security a bit. If you know you have a few winters like that, where you uh, have significantly less actionable uh, mm -hmm. nights, um, and you've seen many of those in the last uh, last decade or so. Yeah. yeah. If you perceive the same for the upcoming winter, um, I think it's important not to kind of let your guard down. On mm -hmm. oh, it's just going to be you know we're going to use the same uh, you know supply of road treatment material. And how it need the same number of of people to help clear the roads and treat the roads. Yeah, that's that's actually not an un, not an unfair way of looking at it because uh, as we pointed out in the the forecast itself, um, the last ten years does go into our mix uh, in the forecast and has been yeah. our ultimate forecast a little less cold than you know otherwise it would be if we were depending far more on the on the analogs. So that is uh, that is part of the mix, but uh, yeah, one one can't afford to be uh, uh, complacent about it at all. Excellent. Well, great job, Stephen. Um, appreciate the outlook, and especially something I didn't think of of the Hunga Tonga volcano and the impacts on uh, you know global weather. I thought that was very fascinating. So, well, really... thanks to our colleague uh, Jeff Johnson for for delving into that. Excellent. It's Jeff's very interesting. Guy. Yeah, mm -hmm. smart man. <laughs> so, Willie, Troy, thanks for your expert insights. Really appreciate it. And I want to thank everyone for joining the Winter Outlook today. Uh, one important thing to note is that this presentation video and a report will be distributed via email soon. Uh, so, please check, keep an eye on your inbox, as Anitha mentioned uh, earlier. So, thank you all again. With that, we'll close and uh, have a pleasant remainder of your day. Bye, everybody.